Good morning. It's good to see you here. Hey, we have palms for you when you leave, so don't leave without a palm because there's a bunch of them. So take them with you. <laughs> take two. Take two palms with you. And then wave them all week long, right, as we celebrate the beginning of Holy Week with Palm Sunday. But before we dive into our final teaching on, uh, on the church, on who it is that we are, body language, I want to talk to you about one or two things. One is, is that we've been in this prayer emphasis for several months now, where we've asked everybody to set their cell phone at 7.02 a.m. and 7.02 p.m., and then remember to pray for somebody that has not yet accepted uh, the gift of eternal life, God's good grace into their life, right? So we've been doing that for quite some time now. Starting on Easter Sunday, we are going to take a prayer journey from Easter to Pentecost. And there are prayer journals available. Uh, they're out in the lobby. You can see them on the table there. Feel free to grab one. But we're calling everybody to prayer from Easter to Pentecost, right? That's 50 days. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon God's people. But uh, this prayer journal will call us to be mobilized in our mission. Now, you just saw the video on 500 baptisms. So let me say something about that, okay, just for a second. And I don't need to because you're, you already know, but a lot of times I say things more for me than anybody else. I don't know if you're that way, but I do. So uh, we know baptism does not save us, right? That water doesn't save us. That's, there's, there's nothing special about the water. What baptism is, is it's a profession of what Jesus Christ has already done in us. And so when we talk about a goal of 500 baptisms, what we're really talking about is bringing people into a relationship with Jesus Christ and then them professing that belief in Christ through our sacrament of baptism. So that's what we're challenging all of us to do in, in the next three years. And we've been off to a great start. This coming Easter Sunday, we're gonna celebrate baptism in a little bit different way but all throughout the service, we'll be doing baptisms and we'll be celebrating baptisms. It's gonna be cool to celebrate a personal resurrection on Resurrection Sunday. If you haven't been baptized and you'd like to be, make sure you talk to one of the pastors in the lobby so we can get you signed up for that. But, uh, but also, in reaching our goal, Easter is significant in that. So let me tell you what happens on Easter and during this week. People are more sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives this week than perhaps any other week throughout the church year. So here's what data says. Data says that over 80% of people are appreciative of somebody who invites them on a spiritual journey during this week. Now, I want you to think about that. Doesn't mean eight out of 10 people are gonna come to church with you next Sunday, if you ask them, but it means they're at least appreciative and they're more responsive to it. So this week is kind of like the high week of the church, not only because it's, it's, right, it's the passion and everything that means, but it's on everybody's mind. And it's just an opportunity for you to invite family and friends. And next Sunday, we're gonna have a, just a great resurrection celebration. We're gonna have baptisms. We're gonna, we're gonna hear a clear, powerful uh, gospel message. So, uh, so it's a great Sunday to reach out and invite Invite your family and friends to join you next Sunday. So let's do that together collectively as a community. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your goodness, your grace. Thank you for your presence. Jesus, I wanna thank you for, uh, for John and Harry who preached the last several weeks. And Lord, how much we appreciate, uh, how, much we appreciate how you have gifted people, Lord, and, and, and how they've been such a blessing to us. So Lord, we just praise you for that. Now, Lord, teach us in this message. Right, call us to action this week, but teach us in this message about who it is that we are, how you see us. Lord, help us to grow in understanding in that. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen. So this is Palm Sunday. This week begins Holy Week. And it's a great week to end our series on body language, to understand exactly how Jesus views you and how he views me. So it was three years since his temptations. It's been three years since Jesus was baptized. During that time, he's performed miracle after miracle after miracle. He's fed 5,000, he's walked on the water, he's casted out demons. And now 
He is riding into Jerusalem at the busiest time for Jerusalem of the year. You see, Jesus is doing it on purpose. Jesus is on mission in the triumphal entry. It's Passover week. And the population of Jerusalem has exponentially expanded. And Jesus' fanfare, his popularity has never been higher. Because you know what Jesus just did? In a small town, Bethany, he just raised from the dead one of their significant citizens, Lazarus. Man, and the word has spread from Bethany into Jerusalem. So, I mean, the crowd is filled up with ecstatic hope. I mean, the buzz is everywhere. They're excited about Jesus coming in. There's talk about him being the Messiah. There's talk about him uh, reestablishing Israel to their place of height. And when he arrives in town, the crowds respond accordingly. I mean, man, they're shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I mean, they're, they're tearing palm branches off and they're laying them on the ground. They're taking off their cloaks and laying it before the donkey as he comes and rides into town. Now, when he gets in the town, he dismounts and he heads right for the temple. This is Palm Sunday. This is right after the triumphal entry. And then this is what Jesus does. Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. Did you catch that? He's driving out. In other words, he's kicking out, right? He's forcing people out that were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. After that was over, over he taught. He said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So you get the action. There's the triumphal entry. Everybody's excited about his arrival. The crowd is, is kind of whooped up into this fervor. Jesus gets off the donkey. He heads right to the temple. And when he gets to the temple, we see a Jesus that we're not used to seeing. I mean, we see a Jesus who is pushing people out. We see a Jesus who is flipping over money changers' tables, knocking over the, the tables of the people who are buying and selling animals for sacrifice. We see him chasing out and cleansing, in a sense, the temple. And he's not smiling. He's a little bit upset. He's angry about the situation and the circumstance. And, and so we see a Jesus in this moment who is not happy but incredibly frustrated and angry. Now, when we see these actions at first, we can, we can think many things about them. And I'm sure people in his day did, right? They probably thought, oh, this is fairly controversial. I mean, Jesus ran into the temple and he did all these things. Boy, Jesus is being argumentative. Look, he's, he's, you know, he's upsetting the status quo and he's being argumentative. At very least, some people probably thought he was being disrespectful in this moment. But if we understand what he was doing, and we understand the circumstance, what we understand is that Jesus was acting in love. You see, the temple was a place of God's dwelling. It was set at the highest point in Jerusalem. So there's every place you are in Jerusalem, you can look up and you can see the temple, right? High and, and above, representing what God is supposed to be in our lives that he's supposed to be the priority, that he's supposed to be the highest point, that the community and us individually rally around him. It was a physical sign, the temple, of a spiritual reality. God is with us. It was supposed to be a place to connect with God, a place of generosity in, in spirit and body. But in these moments, at this time in history, the temple had become twisted. The temple was being used for personal and political gain. Like the buying and selling in the temple that infuriated God was against a corrupt system. I mean, what made God angry about what was happening in the temple was not fair commerce. I mean, if the commerce was fair, sure, probably no problem, a great service, but the commerce was not fair. It was corrupt and it infuriated God. The buying and selling in the temple, right, was, was a corrupt system. 
And the temple was a place where you brought your sacrifice to find forgiveness. But for the sake of personal and political gain, Annas installed what had become to be known as Annas' court, a place where you buy your sacrifice for your sins. Now, I want you to know, it wasn't initially a bad idea, right? I mean, it, it could be quite a level of convenience, like to have these animals there and, and you could, instead of traveling all across the country and bringing a herd of lambs with you or a flock of lambs with you, I mean, you, just, you could just show up at Annas' court and buy a lamb to present as sacrifice. It could be considerably convenient, especially if, uh, you know, if you weren't a rancher of any sort or if you lived in the city and you didn't raise lambs. I mean, right, you could, you could, easily, just, uh, you could easily just buy your sacrifice at the temple. But, but the only issue was, is that, is that buying a lamb at the temple became a lot like buying a soda at Citizens Bank Park. Now you're following me on this, aren't you? I mean, right outside the gates of Citizen Bank Park, you could buy a two liter soda for $1.64. But the minute you step inside the gate of Citizens Bank Park, that $1.64 two liter bottle costs you $8.64. Right, 50 cents worth of popcorn becomes $10. A 75 cent hot dog becomes $12. Three cents of whooped sugar with a little bit of color add to it becomes a $9 cotton candy. Now we've all experienced this, right? I mean, I've gone to the ballpark and I paid more for concessions than I paid to get into the ballpark, right? I mean, I mean we've, we've kind of gotten used to it. We, we understand it, but long before Citizens Bank Park, the priest at the temple were gouging their customer base, so to say. Here's what would happen. A person would bring their sacrifice, this lamb, to offer as their sacrifice to God for the forgiveness of their sins. They would arrive with a lamb, right? Every lamb had to be inspected to make sure that it was clean and that it was perfect. So they would bring their lamb to the, ins to the inspector before they entered into the temple courts and the inspector would declare their lamb unclean or unfit or not perfect. Therefore, the lamb wasn't acceptable. Well, the person could run out. They could get another lamb from their flock. They could bring another lamb. It would still be declared unclean, not fit, imperfect. No matter how many times they would do this, their lamb would always be declared unclean. In fact, there was only one place where you could get a clean lamb for sacrifice. You guessed it, Annas' court. But when you went into Annas' court to buy a lamb for sacrifice, you might be able to buy a lamb just outside the temple gates for $50, the going price. But inside Annas' court, the price was $300 for a lamb. Highway robbery. And it's bad enough when robbery happens in the highway, but when it happens in the temple, that which is supposed to like symbolize God's presence with us, boy, it's doubly, triply, quadruply offensive. So the Sadducees, who were in charge of the temple, you know, you have the Pharisees, the sect, the Sadducees, the fact that the Pharisees were in charge of the synagogues, the neighborhood churches, the Sadducees were in charge of the temple. The Sadducees would take the extra $250 per lamb and they would line their pockets. It would help them buy their fancy robes and their luxurious homes. And it would help them buy political favor. You see, Rome occupied Israel at this time. And it was the Romans who appointed who the high priest was going to be. So one of the things that the Sadducees would do with the money is they would use the money to bribe the Roman officials for control of the temple to decide who was going to be the high priest. You know, it's called Annas's court. And the reason it's called Annas's court was because he was the high priest when they established all this, when they established the opportunity to gain the money that they gained so that they could bribe the Romans so that Annas could always remain high priest. Now, I know if you know your Bible, you're gonna say, wait a minute, Annas wasn't the high priest at this time. Caiaphas was the high priest but you do know who Caiaphas was. He was Annas' son-in-law. Keeping it in the family, just keeping it in the family, right? I mean, just greasing the palms and making the deals under the table just to keep it in the family. 
And it wasn't long when Caiaphas wasn't high priest that guess who was high priest again? Annas was high priest. Well, with control of the temple, they could keep the money machine rolling and produce prosperity for themselves, produce powerful control over the people and keep control of the high priesthood. Well, this is the scene that Jesus enters. I mean, Jesus enters his father's house and can't help but react to what he is experiencing and what he is seeing. So what happens is his love kicks into action, right? He loves and man, so he just was so angry. He was infuriated by what he saw happening in his father's house. I mean, here's the way it works. This is the way love works. If you are going to love like God loves, oftentimes you're going to be misunderstood. Right? Jesus' love motivated him in the moment. Right? It, 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 his love motivated him to do many things, right? It motivated him to open the eyes of people's hearts so that they could see. It motivated him to call people to their fullest life, which is always in surrender and service to God. I mean, I mean man, his love often spurred him to do many things. And his love often required him to speak truth to power. And in a sense, that's what he's doing in this moment. And, and we can understand that because Jesus simply wanted that which represents him and his father to be like him and his father. I mean, he wanted people to find comfort and he wanted them to find peace and he wanted them to find grace at the temple. He didn't want the temple to be filled with profit or, or be filled with politics or be filled with personal gain. That's not what he wanted. And Jesus in these moments wanted to untwist all the twisted up thoughts and actions and offer God's transforming love. But those whose hearts are closed, I mean, those who don't have spiritual insight to understand what is taking place, whew, did they kick into action too. Only they didn't kick into action in the same direction Jesus was going. No, they kicked into action the opposite direction. And in fact, we read in Mark chapter 11, after the cleansing of the temple, what their decision was. It says this in verse 18 of the same chapter. The chief priest and the teachers of the law heard this. They probably saw it also. And they began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna love, I mean, if you're really gonna love, the reality is you're not always going to be loved back. But that doesn't stop you. I mean, if you're gonna love like God, you just continue to love whatever the response is back towards you. So whether we like it or not, the Sadducees took some steps. They revved up their political machine. They looked for somebody who would betray Jesus and they, and they found one of his own who agreed to betray him, Judas. And then they created false charges against him and they had a mock religious trial. They found him guilty and then they took it outside of their own realm. They took it to the Roman public officials and then they whooped the crowd up against Jesus. And in simply four days, we go from the triumphal entry to Jesus being beaten, bloodied, and his dead body hanging on the cross. So the ferocious love of God killed in the fashion of a criminal's execution. And in just a short time, four days, that march of triumph turns to tragedy. And we can say that the battle for that temple, the battle for that temple is over. And every sign, I mean, every sign we look at from that point on throughout history says the battle for that temple is over. And and I know it bothers me. This bothers me. I don't like the thought of it. I don't like the thought of it because, because you know, I, I think, hey, Jesus is a winner. Jesus wins. 
but he didn't win the battle for that temple. Now, now I, I know, I know, I, I don't like it either, right? Because I'm like, man, Jesus is a winner, but in this case, it, it definitely looks like all the signs point to the fact that he, that he lost. Now, now, I know you're gonna say the same things I'm gonna say as I'm processing this, right? So I said, now, now, hold on a minute. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. I agree with that. I believe that 110%, absolutely, I believe that. And as he hung there on that cross, who was in charge of the temple? Annas and Caiaphas. They were in charge of the temple. And I know you're gonna say, same thing I do, hey, he rose three days later victorious. No, no, I get that. I believe that 100%, man. Man, I'm telling you, next Sunday, we're gonna have a great service. It's gonna be so exciting to be here, right? And, and on Easter Sunday and, and re-celebrate, because we celebrate it every single Sunday, but re-celebrate it on the high day of the church that way. I get it. But who controlled the temple that Easter morning when he walked out? The same people that controlled it three days earlier. In fact, if you would ask, who controlled the temple when he appeared to his disciples? Remember, he appeared to his disciples in that room and all the disciples were afraid for their lives. And Jesus appears to them alive. Who was in control of the temple? Or when it, when it came time for the ascension and, and Jesus ascended into heaven, who was in charge of the temple? Or when Pentecost Sunday came and the Holy Spirit was poured out on the believers, who was in charge of the temple? Or in Acts chapter three, you remember the story in Acts chapter three when, when Peter and John went to the temple? Remember, they went through the gate called Beautiful and there was a crippled man there begging. Remember, he was begging and, and then Peter looks at him and says, hey, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have we give you. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And then that crippled man stood up and he walked. I mean, what a miracle. Well, who was it that arrested them? Who was it that interrogated Peter and John? Who was it that beat Peter and John? I mean, unless I'm mistaken, it's the same people that revved up their political machinery just months previously. So, so I mean, when we look, when we look, man, from every side, it's like Jesus lost the battle for, for that temple. He lost and the Sadducees won. You know, still to this day, it was, I don't know, two weeks ago, that, that several people from our congregation, right? We had traveled to the Holy Land. We stood on the Temple Mount where the temple was and the Dome of the Rock is there today. And, and you know what? You can't even read your scriptures on the top of the Temple Mount. It's not legal. You can't open your Bible and read about Jesus on top of the Temple Mount still to this day. I mean, you look at it and you say, well, from every sign, man, it looks like Jesus lost the battle for the temple. He lost and the Sadducees won. And the battle for the temple is over. Unless, now bear with me here, unless we misunderstand something. Unless in some sort of way there's a, there's a hidden truth wrapped up in all of this. If there's some sort of shift. You know, Jesus is always that way in his teaching, wasn't it? It's like, it's like his disciples always believe one thing and then Jesus would teach it and then, and then they'd go, wait a minute, we don't even understand what you're saying. And then he would explain it to them. Because, you know, he's... he's and and. And so unless it's something like that in the moment where, where Jesus is trying to unpack this whole idea of the temple for us, I mean, maybe what needs to happen to us when we, when we view the scriptures and when we think about ourselves, we just need our eyes opened in a different way. Like, 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 like the Pharisee Saul. Uh, you know the Pharisee Saul, right? The Pharisee Saul became the apostle Paul. And he had an eye-opening experience. I mean, he didn't understand Jesus or Jesus' followers, right? He thought they were a threat. So what he did was he, uh, he hunted them down. He persecuted them. He put them to death until his eyes were opened. 
And it wasn't that, it wasn't that Saul wasn't an educated person. I mean, we have, we have data that tells us that, that, that Saul was one of the most educated of all of his people in Israel. It wasn't that he wasn't smart. He was brilliant. He was brilliant and he was educated. If you'd walk into his office and you'd look at the diplomas on his wall, you would be incredibly impressed by where he went to school, by where he graduated in his class, by who his teachers were. It wasn't that he wasn't educated. Of course he was educated. He just wasn't quite educated in the right direction at the time. I mean, he was, he was educated in, in the wrong direction. Or his, or his education wasn't completed. And, and in fact, it was so wrong that if you remember the experience in the book of Acts, Jesus had to knock Paul off his donkey. And then he had to shut his eyes before he could reopen his eyes. You remember the story. I mean, right? Then Saul ended up blind and he ended up on Straight Street. And then, then, then Jesus tells Ananias, you got to go to Straight Street. And you got to pray for Saul so his eyes open up. And man, Ananias is like, are you crazy? I'm not going to Straight Street. He kills Christians. I'm not doing that. And, and then he's like, no, you got to go. So Ananias goes and he prays for Saul. And then Saul's eyes were opened. And when they were opened, he saw everything different. He saw Jesus differently. He saw Jesus' followers differently. He saw himself differently. I mean, he was so different, he couldn't even go by the same name. I mean, he had been so transformed, he would no longer be called Saul. He was given the name Paul. And one of the things he saw differently was this whole idea of the temple. Like this iconic thought of the temple of what it is and, and what it means. I mean, all of a sudden his eyes opened up and he began to think differently about it. Like, like he wrote these words with his new eyes. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So, so maybe, maybe that temple on the mount in Jerusalem was never the temple Jesus came after. I mean, maybe it was just never the temple that, that he came after. Maybe, maybe the temple was God's thousand year object lesson. That he was, that he was teaching us something through that physical structure of the temple. Maybe the temple was simply symbolic or, or it was a foreshadowing of what was to come. Maybe the temple was just a step on the path of real and true understanding. I mean, could it be? Could it be that Jesus didn't come after a temple built by human hands? That's not what he was interested in. Could it be that Jesus isn't interested in this building? Could it be that Jesus is way more interested in who comes in here than the structure itself? You know, Paul goes on. He like doubles down. He makes this argument over and over again about the temple, right? Because, because sometimes we get stuck. But in Acts 17, the apostle Paul argues this. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temple built by human hands. So I don't know, I think, I think that, that we can be comfortable saying he lost the battle for that temple of stone. But who really cares? I mean, who cares if that's not the battle he came to fight? Like if that wasn't the battle Jesus wanted to fight, who cares if, 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 if you know, if the Sadducees stayed in, in, in control of the temple? I mean, who really cares if that's not what Jesus was fighting for? Do you know how easily distracted we become? We become so easily distracted in life. And what happens is we start fighting battles that Jesus isn't fighting. 
but we attach Jesus' name to it and we, we sanctify it, we spiritualize it, we make it about him and it's, it's not the battle he's fighting. Like we'll fight over traditions or we'll fight over technology or we'll fight over whatever candidate we want. We fight over the temple of block and mortar. But that's never the battle that Jesus came to fight. I mean, his target was never a political office. His target was always you and you and you. He was never confused about why he came. You were always his target. He came to fight for the temple that is you. And, and I know, I know we look at it, right? And, and I think about this, even when we were in Israel, right? This is, it's so fun to debate different stuff, right? It is so fun to debate different stuff. So we're in Israel and, you know, and somebody goes, oh, where do you think the Ark of the Covenant is? Where do you think the Ark of the Covenant is? And it's like, does it matter? I mean, we make movies about it, right? Raiders of the Lost Ark. That was a good movie. Years ago, it dates me. But anyhow. But I mean, right, it was a great, I liked the movie. But, but I mean, does it matter? Because you know what the Ark of the Covenant is, don't you? You know in the Old Testament what the Ark of the Covenant is? The Ark of the Covenant is the throne of God. That's what it is. And, and where those two angels' wings, the cherubim wings, fold across the top, that's supposed to be symbolically where God sits. That's his throne. So today when somebody goes, oh, where do you think of the Ark of the Covenant is? It's like, I can tell you where it is. Where's the throne he wants to sit? What's the seat he wants to sit in? It's right here. Every single one of us, our hearts is the Ark of the Covenant where God Almighty wants to sit, where he wants to reign, where he desires to be king. And and so all of this, like it changes the question, right? I mean, the question becomes this, is Jesus winning the battle for you? Because that's the battle he came to fight. And, and I think there's a lot of, like there's a lot of incredible uh, truth in, in this story of what Jesus does. Like it tells us one thing about Jesus, he is willing to turn over every table He's willing to, 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 to climb over every hindrance. I mean, he is willing to stop every force that hinders you from coming to him, that hinders you from receiving him as Savior and Lord. In fact, forget Annas' court and forget all of those lambs in Annas' court that would cost you a ton of money to buy for the forgiveness of your sins. You know how far he's willing to go? He's willing to go so far that he himself will be the Lamb of God that once and for all takes away the sin of the world. I mean, man, I mean, you look at this whole thing laid out and you're like, wow, and you're who he's fighting for. He's not fighting for that temple of block and mortar. He's fighting for you. He wants to sit on the throne of your life. Man, God has designed and built you to be his dwelling place, you. I mean, even Peter jumped on the bandwagon of this thought, right? In 1 Peter, Peter writes this, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, I mean, here's the question about the temple. Is he winning the battle for you? I mean, have you opened up your heart to his goodness and his grace? Have you become his dwelling place? Have you, have you become what represents to your family and the community the good grace of God? I mean, how is he doing in his battle for you? Because, I mean, he's willing to, he's willing to fight any, 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 any opponent. He's willing to, 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 to turn over any obstacle for you. 
have you received his wonderful grace? And I mean, I, I don't know where you're at this morning. I mean, maybe this morning you sit there and you say, well, you know what? I, I guess I never realized that, that I am the temple. You are. That's what the scripture tells us. You are where he wants to reign. You. I guess I never realized that before. You, you, may be, you may be sitting there and saying, well, you know, I've, I've accepted his gift of grace. I've accepted, you know, that he's my savior. I haven't quite yet decided whether I'm going to let him sit on the throne of my life and be my Lord and be my king. I mean, I want all the good stuff. I just don't know if I want the best stuff, which is his day in and day out leadership in our lives. And, and I don't know. There is probably some of us here that you've been so abused and misused and not appreciated and not loved. It may be even hard for you to think about yourself as the temple that God himself wishes to dwell in. But you are. And if you give him a chance, he'll even turn those tables over for you. So, so I don't know, right? Palm Sunday, triumphal entry, big day, the life of the church. I think it'd be okay to do something a little different. Not really different. We, right, we used to do this regularly all the time. And then, then, you know, COVID scares us. And so we, you know, we pull back from some things. But, but anyhow, I, I think it'd be okay this Sunday to say, you know what, these altars up here, we're going to make available for you to come and pray for whatever you need to pray about. Maybe it's coming to the realization of how much Jesus values you, how important you are to him. I mean, maybe that thought in and of itself can revolutionize your life, right? I mean, maybe it's I've never accepted the good grace he offers me. Man, this would be a great morning to do that. Maybe it's say, I need to make him Lord. I need to let him sit on the throne. And, and hey, this would be fantastic, let's do that, triumphal entry, right? That's what we're talking about, you know? Man, praise be to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I mean, maybe it's this morning and you've recognized all these things and your eyes have been opened and you have lived in this bright light of Jesus and you just want to praise him and celebrate. You know, there's nothing magical about, about this wood up here that we call an altar. There's nothing magical about it. You know what is absolutely significant? Is when we respond to him at these altars. There's nothing magical about that. Just like there's nothing magical about the water in the tub when we baptize somebody. Man, the power is in and him to hear. That's the significance. So this morning, man, we just want to make this available. All right? If you want to get up and you want to say, man, I just want to praise Jesus. All right, it's Palm Sunday. I just want to praise him. Or you want to say, man, Lord, I never realized how deeply you love me or who it is that I am. I never realized how you look at me. Man, it'd be a great Sunday to embrace all of that. So, so we're going to stand and we're going to worship and we are going to worship. And if you want to respond, hey, these altars are here for you to respond to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and his great love on your behalf. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you got a lot out of it. If you feel like you need to respond, you can visit fairviewvillagechurch.com slash prayer and you can fill out the forms there and let us know how we can be praying for you. Or you can scan the QR code below and that'll take you everywhere you need to go for next steps. Thanks so much for joining. We hope you have a great week and looking forward to connecting with you.